everybody. Welcome to my channel. I am Crystal Ann Compton, and I am so excited to be with you here today. I hope you're having an amazing holiday season, and I hope you're already thinking about the wonderful new year that you are ushering in. Can I get an amen? We all are. We are all tapping into the blessings, and there's so many blessings, and there are enough blessings for everyone. And these are going to be made manifest in our experience in this year to come. I believe it. To him or her who believes all things are possible, and I know that is possible. And so it is. In this video, I am coming at you with a recent conversation I had with just like such a wonderful person. This person like just made me happy talking to him. I had never met him before, but I was super interested in his subject matter. His name is Yogi Aaron. Yogi Aaron is also searchable and findable on YouTube. And in fact, a link in the description. And my conversation was all about how I guess a lot of us have just been doing it wrong. We've been doing it wrong if we've been doing yoga or the way we've been exercising, moving our body. We've kind of been doing it wrong because Yogi Aaron tells us that we should not stretch. I know. Wild. Because all I've ever heard is that we should be stretched. I stretch before I go for a run or stretch before I go for a walk. Stretch after you do all of these things. And so we've kind of grown up learning about stretching and thinking that it's vital to our health. But Yogi Aaron has a few other ideas and he's actually created his own yogic modality, which involves something called muscle activation. I was really interested. Now, of course, it's not just all about muscle activation and asanas and poses and your body. This is also about spirituality and making that profound connection with your body temple. Your body is a temple and we ought to be honoring it and doing what we can to be strong and healthy and thriving in this world. And so we talk about all of this and so much more. This is from the most recent episode of my Life Magnetics podcast. By the way, if you're not subscribed, I don't get it. I don't get it. I Make sure you find me on your favorite podcast platform and hit that subscribe and give me a good review. It always helps. We need all the help we can get getting the word out and having these conscious conversations. Without further ado, let's get into my conversation today with Yogi Aaron. I think you're going to like this. Um, I would like to welcome to Life Magnetics, Yogi Aaron. Yogi Aaron is the creator of the revolutionary approach to yoga called Applied Yoga Anatomy plus Muscle Activation, as well as the online platform, The Yogi Club. He is the host of the yoga podcast, Stop Stretching. It's the name of your podcast. I listened to some of it. And the yeah. author of both the autobiography of a naked yogi, which I love, and Stop Stretching, a new yogic approach to master your body plus live pain-free. Last but never least, Aaron is also the co-owner of Blue Osa Yoga Retreat and Spa in Costa Rica, where he leads the Yogi Club Yoga Teacher Training Immersions year-round for students from all over the globe. Welcome to the podcast, Yogi Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm really excited because... From what I'm learning about you, um, everything we have learned about stretching and yoga, maybe we need to examine and call into question, which I have I have my personal thoughts about. But before we get into all of that, <laughs> what I would really like to hear from you is like, what led you to developing this modality? Like, what is your story? What brought you to this moment in your life? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who are you well that's a boring <laughs> i um well at this moment as you're as we're talking right now i'm 50 years old um I'm turning 51 in february i'm an aquarian aquarians are the trailblazers of the galaxy <laughs> and <laughs> um i I think like a lot of people, I got into yoga because I I wanted to stretch. And I think um, I've actually verified this through a lot of different polling that like everybody, I thought that stretching equates to being healthy and being young. And so when you see, you know, younger, older people acting younger, one of the things that sort of 
you know, registers is that, oh my God, they have a lot of mobility. And so the opposite of mobility is tight muscles. And so I started to get into yoga because I was trying to stretch those muscles to become more quote unquote flexible. And almost immediately I injured myself. Now I didn't injure myself while I was doing yoga, I was actually doing another um, activity, but it was enough for me to go, what's going on here? Like I'm so young, I shouldn't be having these kind of problems. You know, my grandfather hurts his back. You know, me at 18 doesn't hurt my back. So I got, but the solution was, was to do more yoga, AKA to stretch. So the solution was to stretch, to become more flexible. And my journey kind of took me into Ashtanga yoga. Now, I think it's really important for people to understand because if you ask people why they stretch, generally it's because they feel better. And there's no doubt that you feel feel in the moment better from stretching. And, and that's what happened with me a lot. I would stretch and, it, you know, especially if I was in pain and then I would feel better. I would do all of these hip openers. I would contort my body into a pretzel. I would have a teacher force my forehead to my knees in a seated forward bend, but the problems always came back and usually they came back within less than 24 hours. So I would wake up each morning stiff as a board, not really able to move my body out of bed, but it would slowly creak myself awake. And then I would start my Ashtanga yoga practice. Um, and then I would feel better. And I would be like, yeah, that yoga practice rocks, like <laughs> kicking ass, like, yeah. And then it would be a rinse cycle and repeat sort of situation. And that kind of dragged on for the better part of 25 years. I mean, there's a lot to inject into that story, um, but it really kind of culminated when I ended up in the surgeon's office and I was about 45 at the time. So it was about five years ago. And he was telling me that I might need a spinal fusion in my lower back. And, you know, I was talking to another yoga teacher that didn't deal with that problem, but something similar. And I think it's something that a lot of us have to confront is like, who are we as yoga teachers when we have these like debilitating, um, you know, problems? I have a friend who I will not name on this podcast, but <laughs> <laughs> who's a senior yoga teacher, we're very close. She's had hip replacement. She's had knee replacement. She's had other, you know, things going on in her body. She's dealt with frozen shoulders. And do you think that she has changed one thing in the way that she teaches? Probably not. No. <laughs> no. And, and, and I think it's very, you know, I am, but I, on the one hand, I think it's crazy. On the other hand, I think I empathize with it a lot. Like I can totally understand that resistant uh, mindset, you know, when we get stuck in, in a rut and when that rut is, is really forms our identity, you know, how do we break free from that? And it, it's hard, it's hard to do that. And so I think for me, it took that moment as a wake up call and proceed or, or following that. I spent time with this guy named Eric Stiebel, um, who is one of my sort of unspoken gurus, <laughs> teachers, he's not a yoga teacher, he's not a spiritual person at all. Um, but he is a master of the body, like he understands the body so well. And, um, and, but one day he was working on me, and he was using this methodology called muscle activation technique. And muscle activation technique is a, is a technique designed by Greg Roscoff. Um, it's out of Colorado. And he started do he's he had been actually doing it on me for many years. So it wasn't the first time. And I I knew it was like this golden technique because every single time I went to him broken, he would always fix me within one session. And then we would do more to kind of uh, fortify it. But he did, did this thing where he got my muscles strong. He specifically it was the hip flexors. And he got my hip flexors strong. So hip flexors is when you're able to, if you're lying on the ground and you lift your leg up, right? And then he did this very passive stretch. So the muscle was strong. Then he did this very, very passive, 
it was unobtrusive. Like it wasn't like I would go, oh, you're stretching me. It was a very kind of passive movement. And the muscle shut down. The muscle disconnected from my brain. So when he went back and tested it, it was testing weak. And I thought to my, that was kind of like, so the, that was my second big light bulb moment. Like, what am I doing to my yoga students? What am I doing to myself? And I vowed then and there, I would never stretch again and never teach stretching. And I haven't. Um, and so I kind of went on eventually, like after some time and went into the MAT training. And one of the things I learned in MAT was that nobody in MAT was doing this, translating this into a yoga world. Cause it's a very much a, it's very much kind of like a one-on-one -on -one practitioner, um, you know, therapist versus practitioner kind of oriented systemology. It's not really like fit for classroom. And so I think that Greg's, I have to assume, I've never asked him, but I assume that Greg, you know, is looking for innovators. And so that's what I did is I kind of went, how do I translate this into yoga? How do I start to bring muscle activation into the yoga world? But the second part of it is the applied yoga anatomy part of it. And that is that I wanted to be able to give yoga teachers and even fitness trainers who I think, and I say this without judgment, I'm not saying this in a, in a kind of, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Um, <laughs> even though it might sound like it, but these people have no idea about functional anatomy. They, they literally don't know much about anatomy at all. But then when we talk about functional anatomy, it's like fitness trainers and yoga teachers are just clueless. Again, I say that as a matter of fact, not as, as being a judgment or anything like that. Yeah. Judgmental asshole. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that was part of what the applied yoga ana anatomy part of it is like, let's teach functional anatomy. So let me give you one quick example, and then I'll let you ask your next question. Mm -hmm. But like one of the things that it actually, this is one of my biggest pet peeves now in the yoga world is you often hear yoga teachers say, let's open the hips. If you ask those same yoga teachers, you know, name me three muscles that are attaching to the hips that you want to quote unquote open. Tell me what those three muscles are and then tell me their function in the hips and then ask and then tell me why would you want to stretch them? Why would you actually want to open them when their function is actually to stabilize the hips? Stabilization actually means you want them to contraction, which means that you actually want the hips to close and not open. So <laughs> now I'll let you ask your question. No, I'm just, I'm fascinated. Um, I'm not, I mean, I've taken yoga classes. I'm not a yogi. I'm not somebody who does it all the time because I've had situations where I just found it, you know, very difficult for me. I wasn't eased into anything necessarily. And I, I will say that many years ago, I took a um, van ride from North Texas up into like Loveland, Colorado. And I, I don't know if it was the bucket seat. I don't know what it was, but I developed sciatica for the first time in my life sciatic pain and it was terrible and i'm like what in the world is going on and i reached out to people and i had a few people send me some stretches which i was super reticent reticent to do because it was already so inflamed or i didn't know what was going on but then i ultimately <laughs> i did this particular stretch which was supposed to immediately alleviate sciatic pain and when i tell you the pain quadrupled and then it just kind of never went away whereas sciatica i think is supposed to be around for a few weeks to a couple months i had it for like half a year and it was debilitating so i'm just validating that um not all stretches are helpful having said that are any stretches helpful <laughs> <laughs> i want to know you know i it's, it's funny you asked that because like a lot of people there's this one girl I've just started following she's from the UK um just more of a fan than 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 her content because I think she really is really a uh, puts out great content and I just I love so much of what she's doing and I I always try and mimic like you know people that are doing it well mm -hmm. and um 
but she she was like I could I some of her newest videos are like starting to talk about muscle activation but then they always kind of slide in like but yes you want those nice juicy stretches and I'm like why <laughs> so the answer the short answer is no the long answer longer I won't make it that long but anytime we passively stretch we shut muscles down and so what that means is like that means a few things um and i can describe it like about three or four different ways but one of them is like um you have this proprioception between the brain and the muscle the so just if that's hard for you to imagine what that's like it's like you have a telephone wire connected from your brain to your muscle anytime you stretch you might as well just take like a pair of cutting scissors and just cut that connection and the connection depending on how much what your age is how much stress trauma and overuse you've had in your life it can take a long time for that connection to rehabilitate so if you're 16 years old and you're stretching your muscles out your muscle that proprioception is going to bounce back really quickly and in some cases it may not even disappear but if you keep stretching over and over and over, which you see gymnasts doing and ballerinas doing, then you end up at the age of 22 with ACE bandages on your elbows and shoulders and, you know, knees and have to wear those kind of, you know, those weight belt uh, sort of things to get stability in your lower back because none of your muscles are no longer working. So anytime muscles start to shut down, and in your case, it was very intuitive of you as much as you wanted to stretch when you had sciatica it's the stretching doesn't deal with the problem so the problem with sciatica there's a few things going on but definitely one of them is like there is an inflammatory response and one of the things that we know it, from an mat perspective from a muscle activation perspective is when muscles aren't working properly it puts stress on the joints it puts stress um, on the small muscles that are trying to do their job. It puts stress on the tendons and ligaments. And anytime there's stress, there's inflammation. And it's just kind of a, a cycle that keeps repeating itself. And so if you did go in, which a lot of people do, and stretch, sometimes it does make people feel good, but it doesn't get to the root of the problem, which is that there's muscles in the lower back and there's muscles in the glute area. We'll just call it the glute for now. The hip joint is better, um, that are just not doing their job to create stability. And that instability is what's creating or exacerbating mm -hmm. the stress cycle. Um, so we actually want to get in there and get muscles working and right. it, it's not, sometimes a sciatica, it's a little tricky. Like sometimes you can fix it really quick. Sometimes it just takes a little longer, but we can get there. Um, if you're doing the correct things, it can, it can speed it up. So what I, am I hearing you say then that the counterpoint to stretching is muscle, like building your muscle, strengthening your muscle and fortifying the infrastructure. That's what we need to be doing and focusing on. Yeah. And I just want to clear some, be very clear about something because a lot of people might translate what I'm saying into like weightlifting and I'm not talking right. about lifting at all. I'm not even talking about anything to do with weights. When we're talking about muscle activation, what we're talking about is very gentle. Um, and I can't stress that word enough, gentle, <laughs> non-invasive <laughs> um, uh, muscle contraction. So another way of saying that is like isometric contraction. Right, so right. Shortening a muscle and for a certain amount of time doing it so many times so the the rule in in muscle activation from my understanding is six seconds six times so six six and um so whatever you're going to do so an example of that would be like one of my favorite muscle activations is bridge pose so you know bringing your feet you know underneath your knees your heels underneath your knees and lifting your hips up and I like to add this glute squeezing. So really squeezing the glutes and holding it for six seconds. And one, 1,000, two, 1,000, or one Mississippi, two, Miss, gotta be inclusive. <laughs> and, and 
then holding it for six seconds like that way and then coming back down relaxing and then repeating that five more times for a total of six and what we're doing there is starting to reinforce the connection between the brain and the muscle so it's not like you're really strengthening the muscle per se but what you're doing is connecting the brain to the muscle but here's the thing it's like if the brain knows there's a muscle there it's going to start using it you know, if you look at like runners, runners have what often people joke about runners, butt, and because these runners do, are running without glutes that are working, not working properly. I mean, they build up like big hamstrings and sometimes even bigger calf muscles, but their, their butts don't really do much. And I think part of that is because when they're out there running, they're not really using their glutes that much. So if we, if our brain is connected to the muscle, it will start using it more in life. And so I think that by sy synergistically or, or symbiotically, there's a relationship where it will start to build that muscle up, if that makes sense to you. It does make sense. Do you think that this is something someone could use instead of strength training? Because here I am at 54 years old and, you know, I hear a lot about, so you got to do that strength training. It's not so much about cardio. It's about like building up the muscles. Is this something, but, but some, that's hard too, you know, that can be kind of difficult to do sure. that. Is this something that I would be able to do to replace strength training or as a complement to it? I think, you know, cause I'm right behind you. I'm 50 mm -hmm. years old, turning 51. And I constantly ask myself, like, how much strength training do I have? I'm an avid walker, mm -hmm. I'm an avid hiker, you know, I, so why a lot of people say that you should do strength training is two reasons. One, because you do want to create that um, um, uh, resistance so that you start to build up bone density. So that's that's one. Anytime you start to lift things, you're going to improve bone density. And then number two, you know, the old adage, use it or lose it. Well, right. I think let me tell you that most of my program now involves more muscle activation. Um, and I do some strength training. I try to keep up with it just because I like to stay active and I like to stay fit. And I really believe in using my body. Um, and I don't work in a, you know, on a farm tilling the field, all day long. <laughs> I don't work in a job where I'm using my body. So I do try and find uh, intelligent ways um, and, and a lot of, but I will add to like a way that I teach a lot of the muscle activations, there is resistance and there is, um, that kind of, you know, applied force, if you will, like one of my favorite uh, muscle activations, I said bridge pose earlier. Another one is like plank pose. And so you can come do plank on your elbows or, or, you know, with straight arms, like upward push-up position because of the effects that it has on the TVA, the transverse abdominis. It's one of the very few poses that we have um, access to activating our transverse abdominis. And it's just so important. So that right there is going to be a little bit of resistance training. I would encourage people, you know, do what makes you happy. Um, but try to include muscle activation into, into whatever routine you're doing, especially if you are going to do some sort of like workout, do some muscle activation before you go work out. So that way you bring your whole body and being to the workout literally, and you minimize the amount of injury that can take place. Hmm. Okay. Um, so with regard to stretches and all the kind of conventional stretches that we've learned and the stretches that all of us are doing in yoga that go to yoga, are there any stretches in particular that you think are specifically not good that maybe a lot of us are currently doing? <laughs> Let's shop well, them. <laughs> sorry, I have three. Okay. Uh, the first one, <clears> or <throat> the first two are very similar to each other. The first one is child's pose which a lot I love with, child's pose. <laughs> I know, I know, but okay. it's just so, um, and there's a few reasons why. I mean, one of them is just because of the overstretching in the lower back, the overstretching of the glutes, you know, we want strong glutes. And one of the worst things you can do is child's pose because it's going to shut down all of the glutes. But here's the thing, like when you start to overstretch a set of muscles, 
the opposite muscle also shuts down. So now we're looking at all of the hip flexors. So now you're starting yoga practice with no hip flexors, no hip extensors, and no core stabilizers, as well as any lower back um, extensors. So now you've shut down four major groups of muscles just with one yoga pose. Wow. Um, and and I, by the way, just for the record, I have tested it on numerous people. Okay. So <laughs> I've tested like, <laughs> you know, muscle strength before and after, and it just always shuts down muscles. Um, again, maybe if you took somebody who is very athletic, um, who has a very kind of well-oiled machine and that kind of connection between the brain and the muscle is really strong. Those people do exist, but they're the very, like when I say exception, like 0.001%, like they're just, you know, very few and far in between. So that's the first one. The second one would be the opposite of child's pose, which is lying on your back and hugging your knees into your chest. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the same thing. Um, Again, you're kind of overstretching the lower back and the glutes and the, you're kind of forcing the um, hip flexors to over contract. And then the third one is sort of like a generalization, but it's any kind of hip opener. Just stay away uh, like from pigeon pose, you know, any, anything like that. Um, it's just it's it's just going to shut muscles down. So one of the questions I often get asked is, well, I really want to practice those yogi Aaron. They I just feel so good and I really or I think I should really lengthen my muscle. Um <laughs> that's a conversation in and of itself. But if you must, <laughs> if you really must uh stretch. Do it before you go to bed because at least, you know, you're going to go from like, you know, beside your bed where you're doing your yoga poses um, and, and stretching them, quote unquote, to your bed where you're not going to be using your body and there's going to be no opportunity for you to really kind of hurt yourself for the next, you know, <laughs> seven, eight, nine hours. But a lot of times, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've hurt myself, like even in yoga class, you know, I'll, I'll start the yoga class myself as a practitioner in child's pose. And then the teacher will say, okay, come and stand everybody. We're going to do sun salutation A and I'll inhale, bring my arms up, exhale, fold forward. And my lower back gives out. Like it's, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> that's happened to me. And of wow. course, you know, I just go to oh, I'm not a good yogi. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. Oh, you know, like. <laughs> wow. So what I'm hearing you say is that I have to throw out my Rodney Yee AM PM yoga routine. <laughs> it's like the gentlest, like sweetest little yoga thing. But I mean, maybe even that is like, I shouldn't be doing. I mean, because ab afterwards, I do feel very relaxed, just feel very like lovely. So I feel like if it feels good, doesn't that mean it is good? But if over time, it's actually degrading the muscles, then yeah. Well, there's, I, I think I start off one of my podcast um, episodes, like just because you can doesn't mean you should, Right. Um, <laughs> you know, just because you can drink a bottle of wine doesn't mean you should. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> no, but I want to just say something first that I'm not saying it. So I've kind of said a few times like flexibility and stretching, and I tried to separate that from yoga. I am a yoga teacher. I teach yoga. And, and so the idea of yoga is a few things, but one of them is like, how do we, how do we pull our attention inward? How do we you know, get our attention inward. And so the, the ancient Hatha yogis created these postures as a tool uh, for us, if used properly and correctly, which it's often not, um, as a tool for us to be able to pull our senses inwards, okay? Um, and then, so that's kind of one part of, of asana. What I think the other gift of asana, again, if taught correctly, is that we actually can create a more stable body, meaning a body that's free of pain, a body that's strong and stable. Um, and so we just need to kind of like flip the script, if you will, 
on the way that we approach our asana. So I don't know, tell me a pose that you really like that you think is a little stretchy in Rodney Yee's class. Like oh what, gosh, what, no, don't, don't put me on the spot. I don't know, I won't know. Ah! Oh, I don't, tree, okay, well, me, I don't know, I, I don't know. I, let I me like give it. you one, let okay. me give you one. So let's talk about child's pose. Okay, child's pose is- I like down. warrior, I like that one, okay. But <laughs> if you're going to do child's pose, just come onto your stomach. So child's pose is a resting mm -hmm. pose. So instead of doing child's pose, come onto your stomach and do what we call as crocodile pose, makrasana, where you bring your hands like this on top of each other and you rest your forehead onto your hands lying down on your stomach. It's called a prone pose too, mm -hmm. which is scientifically is actually really great for opening up the diaphragm. Another one would be the opposite child's pose, knees to chest, chest pose. So we need to approach the poses in a little bit more of a dynamic way. And what that means is instead of hugging your knees to your chest, just pull your knees in, let your arms rest to the sides and then pull your knees using your muscles. You're now using your muscles to do the work of pulling the knees in rather than having your hands wrapped around your knees, pulling them in. I'll give you one more example. So one is like um, a seated forward fold. So you can take any variation that you want, but instead of trying to reach the hands forward, thus using gravity to pull yourself forward, change the pose by bringing the hands behind the back, resting them at the lower back, and now inhale, exhale, come forward. And now what's doing the work is the abdominal muscles, which is what should be doing the work anyways, because they're the muscles that need to shorten in order for you to bring uh, the torso forward. Now you're refortifying that connection between brain and muscle. Hmm. Wow. Um, for those of you just listening on the podcast, please know that this will be available on YouTube as well if you want to check out actually what he's doing um, and see it for yourself. I just, I'm a very spiritual person, very metaphysical and esoteric. And um, so I have to ask you about that part of it because I would imagine. Do you run up against other people who are into traditional yoga and see you making adaptations and modifications? And is that like, do you have, do they give you a hard time? Is it a little bit controversial? I, I think it's probably a little controversial. And I also want to ask you about the spiritual component of the yoga that you teach and where that exists and how it, you know, how it comes forth. Those are a lot of questions. I'm sorry. So if I just, just come back and ask okay. me. But I am meeting a lot of resistance because a lot of people are addicted to stretching, and um, and stretching and flexibility have hijacked yoga. The words stretching and and, and flexibility have hijacked yoga, and. and I've, I've talked about this in, in one of my podcast episodes, I go through sort of the history of yoga and, and how we got to where we are. Um, but the short answer is like, you know, we've looked at like, if you pick up the Hatha Yoga Pratipika and you say you must practice Paschimottanasana to move prana in Shashumna Nadi in the spine, um, and thus open, you know, the potential for spiritual enlightenment. And so what a Westerner does is looks at that and goes, oh, I have to bring my forehead to my knees and then I'm going to be enlightened. But they're kind of missing the point. And so one of the interesting things I found is it doesn't matter. Like, so if, if we're using posture to affect us energetically, there is absolutely no difference if we're doing a seated forward fold again. There is absolutely no difference, energetically speaking, in someone who can bring their forehead to their knees or someone that can only go forward five degrees. Energetically, it's still going to create a calming, uh, soothing, um, stabilizing effect in the mind. You know, energetically, that's what's going to happen. Now, if we get the breath involved, we get the chakras involved, we get um, an affirmation involved, then we start to amplify it. You know, what I will say is the person who can get their forehead to their knees is probably going to be in pain later on because they've just, you know, created more instability through their flexibility. So the spiritual component component of yoga, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of people that say a lot of things about yoga, you know, yoga is this and yoga is that and blah, blah, blah. 
Um, I always kind of look at yoga through the lens of the first four yoga sutras. And the first one says, now is yoga, you know, so that says a lot, like yoga is about coming to the present. The second sutra says that yoga is when we basically have the cessation of thoughts, like our thoughts have become quiet. And the third sutra, and this is the key sutra for me, is like yoga is when we feel completely at rest and at home within ourselves. And, you know, asana, yoga postures, I often tell my students that they can be the key to your liberation or they can be another prison of your own making. And I think for a lot of people, they've become a prison because we've become so fixated on creating the shape. We've become so fixated on, you know, getting the best yoga pose at the top of a rock overlooking a river <laughs> in the middle of a canyon. You know? Right, your, your Instagram <laughs> poses, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we've, we've become very fixated on that. And, and we really, yoga, the, the promise of yoga is that we can become completely at rest within ourselves. That is yoga, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that your modality or your type of yoga can also lead a person to all of those things? Absolutely. I, in most of my yoga practices that I offer, there's always an intention. There's always like, even if it's you sometimes a 15 minute practice, I'm always like, get your attention inward. Let's go inward and, and feel that sense of, of inner rest because that's without that, what have we got? <laughs> right, absolutely. So now does your yoga incorporate traditional honest asanas, but that are modified or are they like completely new postures that people will not be familiar with? No, no, I would say that it's 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 like ninety percent traditional yoga postures. Um, some postures I won't teach anymore, um, and some modifications I won't teach anymore, just because they're they they use gravity to get into them. They're they're um, uh, kind of you know not not conducive. But I what I do is I weave in a lot of like muscle activation practices, which actually sometimes mimic uh, traditional yoga postures. So we can talk about bridge pose. Bridge pose is a mod is, is a traditional yoga posture, but I've modified it more to use as a muscle activation. Another one would be uh, locust pose. So shalabhasana, uh, which is when you're on your stomach and you lift your chest and your legs up off the floor. It's a great pose. Very few yoga teachers teach it, but it's actually, that is actually one of the poses that I say will reverse the aging process in your body mm. uh, because I know, look at you, Perka. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because of the effects that it has on the health of the spine and the musculature of the spine. And as we get older, our, our back muscles start to atrophy. They start to become tonic. Uh, meaning that they become static, they they no longer are able to contract or lengthen properly, and so they become tonic tonified and tonic. And what we want to do is actually get those muscles supple. And so a lot of things that I do, I found, you know, you just kind of have to flip the script again in your head. Like, what is it that I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to activate. I'm not trying to stretch. Take the whole stretching idea out of your head and ask yourself. How can I start activating in a healthy way? And by activating, I mean shortening the muscle so that your brain starts to uh, reintegrate uh, where those muscles are. Fantastic. Well, let's take it back to you again. I know that you had said that you were told that you were going to have to have an, a surgical intervention. I'm not sure if you did that or not. Um, did you? Have to have the nope. surgery you didn't not do it to, not to this date no knock on my computer <laughs> there you go I'm, I'm knocking with you um so once you set about to find another solution and you started incorporating this knowledge in your yoga how long did it take you to get some actual relief from your pain or your condition after I ended up in the surgeon's office I stopped doing everything that I thought I should be doing which was stretching and I started activating and in full disclosure, I did get um, a um, 
injection of steroids into my lower back, which was a huge ordeal. And one that I don't want to jump back into doing, but after that, I had that injection, it actually got worse. Um, and then it got, it slowly started to get better. And it really took me about two months before I did my first hike. So from that time I got the injection and I went hiking uh, two months later, and then I slowly started to get back more and more into hiking again. And it, so it took me about two months, but it really took me the better part of six months to really get uh, strong again, where I had confidence in my body. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a huge learning experience for me. Like, I think, you know, as we get older, or if, even when we're younger, and we injure ourselves, we lose confidence in ourselves. And I think that one of the boons, the gifts of these muscle activation practices is it helps us to restore confidence in our body, which is so important because if we don't have that confidence, then we're always kind of guarding and mm -hmm. that guarding actually starts to exacerbate and make problems worse. Um, so we want to, you know, that for me, it started to build up that confidence and that kind of inner stability and resilience, if you will. That's interesting. I liken that to becoming chinny if you're a boxer, like a boxer who's boxed for a long period of time starts to hesitate a little bit before he makes a move and he actually becomes more vulnerable. And so you become what's called chinny and you're more likely to be injured because of the hesitation. And I also want to say that my husband, <clears throat> he's a 6'3 kind of guy. This guy could probably still, but definitely used to lift car engines, chop all the wood, super farmer oriented, just very, very strong, but he just turned 49 and he is noticing that his arms are a little thinner. So he gets out on the oak tree and he does these pull-ups and stuff, but I can see him having that lack of confidence. He's like, something's changing. My, my structure, my stability, my core is changing. And I don't know what to tell him to do so that he can regain it because he's not so far removed from it that he probably couldn't get it right back, but I don't even know where he should begin. And to that end, I don't know where I would begin. And so for anybody listening or watching, what are some things that we could start to do right now just to get some of that strength back or that flexibility back with your technique? So first of all, get my book. Yes, yes, please, please show your book. Yes, I'm going to be getting your book. <laughs> Stop stretching. There's like a ton of stuff in here okay. um, that will be really great um, to, you know, and it really will start to educate people about their body in a fun, you know, for those of you who are, are just listening uh, to this podcast, it's kind of done by drawings. And so I really wanted to make it kind of fun, cartoonish a little bit, but also easy to digest. Um, the second thing to do is like go on to uh, my YouTube channel, um, see what's available. There's a lot of different practices. Um, you don't have to do them all. Like there's so many, you just start to rotate them and start to see, you know, what feels better. So with your husband, for example, doing these chin-ups, that's great. You know, go out, use your body. You need to use your body. But the question is, is he, is he going into these chin-ups cold and by but what i mean here by cold is like is the brain actually connected to those muscles mm -hmm. um, is the is the brain connected to all the muscles that are doing you know that are stabilizing the shoulder joint so maybe what he might want to do is like oh does yogi aaron have some shoulder exercises well, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and do some things for the shoulders and, and do some things for the back. And again, a lot of, a lot of our range of motion gets um, diminished, if you will, because the muscles stop shortening. They stop doing their job. It's not about muscles lengthening. It's about the muscles ability to contract properly to shorten properly so like you know if you take your arm up and reach your arm up to the sky you know as we get older that starts to diminish we can't bring our arm up and we think oh i need to stretch that mm -hmm. arm up what's actually going on is that the muscles that are responsible for that arm extension that shoulder extension are not working properly and so we need to get those muscles um, improving their ability to contract if we can start to do that, that's how we start to turn back the quote unquote aging clock in the body that 
you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we lose range of motion or we lose our ability to have mobility as we get older, but that's really not a sign of flexibility per se. It's just a sign of loss of muscle function. So we want to get the muscles working. If we get those muscles working, we start to improve um, our ability to, to stay youthful. One, one of the biggest postures and get your husband doing this and then get him to do chin-ups and I promise you he'll feel better um but you you can do it a couple of ways for your husband i would say bring the arms forward but again shalabhasana lift the legs and lift the chest up as high as you can hold it for six seconds and it will be hard in the beginning you know every single yoga teacher training i start off um, my students in that pose they can barely lift themselves off the floor because the brain isn't connected to any of those back muscles but with time, not only does the brain start to connect to those muscles, but we also get those muscles stronger as a byproduct. And so we're able to lift higher. And as we lift higher, then when we come and stand up, we actually stand stronger, stand more erect, and we're able to um, do those chin-ups a lot more effortlessly. <laughs> wow, it is such a paradigm shift, isn't it? It's just a yeah. totally different, it's a reconceiving of like what we've all been doing for so long. Um, but this this makes a lot of sense to me, a lot of sense. My father-in-law, I think um, when he started getting older and, and older, he was doing something to try and strengthen. And I think he like actually snapped his muscle. It curled all the way up. Like, because there wasn't enough lubrication that he hadn't, it's not yes. strong enough. And it's just like, yeah, you have to approach things a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, I, a couple more questions if you have time. Yes, absolutely. Can, okay, I'm enjoying my conversation so much. And I really am a novice. I'm just such a novice. I'm Rodney Yee on Gaia. That's all I do. Okay. But um, I'm so interested in being stronger. And for me, like the little things that I'll do is I, I'll just sit down on my, my fireplace hearth, which is pretty low, and I'll just stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down probably 20 times. And I'll do that three or four times a day. Um, I do maybe a stupid thing like sit-ups. I'll do sit-ups, um, 30 of them. I don't, I can still do 30 of them. I do planks. I do that kind of stuff to sort of strengthen, but I really, I don't know where to begin or, or where to start. So your YouTube channel, I'm going to check it out. The link is in the description of this podcast and the YouTube, uh, the podcast and the YouTube video. Also, I will put the link for your book in both places as well. And I'm going to get your book. Um, I just think what I'm saying with regard to the paradigm shift is that I want to know whether anybody at any stage of health, wellness, and strength, I would consider myself fairly sedentary. Is your modality, is your technique, is it available to someone like me? Because I don't think I can put my hands up and lift my legs for very long. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> is there like a stair stepping kind of way that we can enter into this yoga? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that I teach meets anybody, almost anybody. Uh, where they are. And, and so there's some exceptions, of course, to that. Um, if somebody's just coming out of surgery, then we need to modify. But, but, you know, you can bring your arms up to the sides. Do that. Bring your arms up to the side, turn the palms up. Now, don't move your chest, keep your chest where it is, but just move the arms back. Okay. Do you feel that in between your shoulder blades? I do. Now you're engaging your middle traps and then relax down. And then do it again, bring the arms out, turn the palms up and then bring the arms back. Now you're engaging middle traps. So part of, um, so if I was gonna do that as a muscle activation, we do it six times. And you know, like what I try and do through all, all my videos, through my book is just try to start asking the question. Like you don't have to know everything. You just have to know how to ask questions. So your question is, where do I start? Okay, well, that's a good question. Another question would be like, why do I have this pain in my neck right now? Well, what, where am I pointing to? I think I'm pointing to my trapezius, my upper trapezius muscle. So if I want the upper traps to work properly, what are some of the synergistic or what are some of the other muscles? Well, one of them is middle traps. Well, if I get the middle trap working, you know, does the pain go away afterwards? Oh my God, it just went away. I actually did that the other day. I had a pain in my neck and I was like, what the heck is going on, Gogi Aaron? Um, <laughs> spending too much time on my computer. That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. But so I just quickly did like two exercises to activate my traps, my actually my upper trap and my middle trap. And then I actually did my lower trap. So I did three. 
And the pain not only went away, but then it didn't return. And so what, what I'm trying to do is teach people like, yeah, we can fix your pain, but also start to try and learn how to identify the pain. Ask the question, what are the muscles that are, you know, around this pain? You know, what are the opposite muscles of it? And you don't have to know the answer. You can go into Google. What is the opposite muscle? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And what would happen if I got that, that muscle working? So I would encourage people just to just start asking questions and experiment with their body. And if you can start to look at your body in that kind of lens, um, you can start to be your own sort of quote unquote therapist and have fun with it. Uh, because that for me is how I've started to learn is just by taking like the little knowledge that I have and just growing it by asking questions. So how many students would you say you have all over the world? Oh, gosh. Well, I've been teaching yoga for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've also been teaching yoga in all kinds of countries. Every I, I've traveled a lot. So I would definitely say in the thousands. I don't, not in the millions, but definitely <laughs> in the thousands. So um, <laughs> having tracked students through your particular style or type of yoga like what if you could give a testimony of a student that had such a profound change by doing this like what kind of a testimony could you give something that you saw somebody shift there's two that come to my mind one is um i call her big mama her name is ginger and i always she knows i talk about her all the time <laughs> because it's she's she's like a big boned woman from uh, new orleans and uh, ergo big mama <laughs> And um, she's just got such a tender heart. And, but she has been following me now for the better part of six years. So she's gone through kind of different iterations and grown with me as I've, I've been growing in this. And she literally just sent me a message just two, three days ago. And I'm not making that up by the way. And um, she's, she was given, it was another message of like, you know, I love you. Um, but one of the things that she said was like, because of all of these shoulder things I've been teaching you just now, um, she's actually been able to avoid having shoulder surgery and she has a torn rotator cuff from, you know, history of stress, trauma and overuse. And because of all of these shoulder activations, her doctors were blown away that she was not needing to have shoulder surgery and she does need to get it eventually, maybe, but she was just blown away that she's been able to avoid it yeah. because and lessen the pain by getting these other muscles that are stabilizing the shoulder joint to work properly. Had she not done it, that would have put more stress on the shoulder cuff um, injury. And then she would have needed to have surgery. Another person has, has had fibromyalgia mm. and which is basically, you know, a problem within the nervous system, which affects uh, muscles and um, her name is Alexis and Alexis is just a huge super fan but partly because of the stuff and and using these muscle activation techniques for her to to deal with the fibromyalgia and it's just it's a testimonial to that if we're dedicated to doing what what our body giving our body what we need and it's not a lot like I always tell people just eight minutes a day will change your life. You, you know, if you can do eight, not don't save the eight minutes up for the end of the week though. <laughs> <laughs> I could see, I could hear or mind read some of your weekend warrior <laughs> listeners. You know, it really, you've got to just do it consistently and refortify that brain to muscle connection. It does wonders in the body and we just feel differently as a result of it. Ah, this conversation has been so wonderful. And one of the reasons why I think we need to talk about this and so much more is because I really think in this day and age, so many of us are checking out of our body. You know, mm -hmm. we're um, disassociating with our body or if we're presenting ourselves, we've got like three filters and we're like, we're, we're so not connected to the body and also the potential of the body. It is my personal belief and opinion that my body is the temple of my spirit. It's a holy and sacred instrument that I chose and selected as a soul to bring into this world to have this adventure. Um, you know, I grew up 
uh, with acute abuse and trauma. And I taught myself from an early age to like not be in my body. And it's taken me many, many years to kind of start to get comfortable with who it is that I am. And also I want to do things that bless my body and make me able to be on the planet in a way that is, it's comfortable. I'm not in pain, but also I'm just being good to myself. And so this is why I've enjoyed this conversation. I might not, I might not understand the entire system of yoga. I do not, but I can feel where your heart is with it and just connecting to people to the potential of the body and looking at it in just a little bit of a different way. Because I do think people try things like yoga and especially the harder forms of yoga and they get disillusioned because maybe they fall into pain or they injure themselves or it's just not working for themselves. So this is a different way to look at it. Yeah. Well, the ultimate goal of yoga is exactly what you just outlined. What, you know, to, I, I phrase it a little differently, but it's basically to live the purpose of your life that each of us have a, a soul desire to live our purpose. And for some people, they're just all of their mental energy, if you want to call it, that goes into managing their pain um, and managing their body. And that's not what I believe the creator had envisioned for us. The creator had envisioned for us to go out and do great things, you know, um, and, and it, it's, that's dependent on each person. But, but if all of our energy is going into managing this form, then we don't have anything left to, to, to live our best life. And, um, and that's kind of what I bring to the table is trying to a get people back into specifically the yoga community right now what is yoga teaching us and uh and then two like let's get our body working properly um Absolutely. As best as we can. <laughs> and become pain free <laughs> <laughs> well and wouldn't you say that if given like time space and intention your body will always rise to the occasion like it, the body seeks to recalibrate and bring itself back into alignment and so if you set the space for that the body will respond yeah i i would i would agree with that and i would also just say it just is individual cuz not everybody some people have lost faith some people have lost purpose some people have lost you know, like, okay, all I'm ever going to do in life is sit on my couch, for example. And, um, and I think we just, you know, like, let's get inspired, let's yeah. inspire it, like, awaken, you know, um, that seed of inspiration It was Rumi said that inspiration is the wings of humankind. And for a lot of us, we've just forgotten that we can fly, forget about wanting to fly that we can fly. Um, and so I hope that my words and in your words and and that's why i love doing these kind of podcasts is like they yes we can fly and but part of that is that we have to we have to be the ones to fly nobody can do it for us but here's some easy and accessible tools that you can use whether it's affirmations meditation positive thinking all of these things you we have to embrace them and and use the tools cuz they're there for us to you know, take flight. <laughs> you are such an inspiring person. What a wonderful vibration you have and um, just your heart and your intentionality. This conversation has been so wonderful. Again, the book is Stop Stretching, y'all. I added the y'all part. Stop Stretching. You can find Don't it on Amazon. <laughs> um, link in the description, your YouTube. I will link that as well. Now, do you work with people one-on-one -on -one if they want to have a Zoom with you? Or do you do any of that kind of business? You do? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, I always encourage people first to use some of the resources rather than coming into me uh, cold. Um, I always kind of point people that direction. I prefer to work with people one-on-one -on -one after they've had a little bit of taste, you know, listen to the podcast, done some of the videos. And, and then if they're still like needing some guidance, I'm absolutely happy to work with people. And I also do trainings in Costa Rica and mm -hmm. who doesn't want to come and spend, you know, some time with me on the beach in Costa Rica. <laughs> I do. That sounds wonderful. Now, do you have a website that I can send people to as well? Or Absolutely. yogiaron.com. So Fantastic. That's sort of the portal to everything. Thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us. I've really enjoyed the conversation and I am inspired to make some changes and you better believe I'm going to be talking to my husband about it too. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>